but when I was young, then, about 11, it was in the Depression, about 11 or 12, something like that. Mm -hmm. I got this telephone call. Oh, you should find me. Yes. We have a radio. This is a hotel. We have a radio that doesn't work, and we'd like to have it repaired. We understand that you can do something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I'm only a little boy, I said. I don't know. Yes, we know that, but we'd like you to come over anyway. Well, they were kind of kidding me. It was my aunt's hotel. It was earlier, another hotel that she was running. Or my aunt's aunt or something. There was some connection. But I didn't know it, you see, and I went over there. Now, they still tell the story. I had a big screwdriver in my back pocket. Well, I was small. Any screwdriver looked big in my back pocket. And I went there. I went up to the radio to try to fix it. I didn't know anything about it. I went to look. And they had a handyman at the hotel. And I, I don't know whether he noticed or I know. I always thought he helped more than a, a loose knob on the rear stat to turn it up, to turn up the volume, so that it wasn't turning the share. Maybe I noticed it or something. He went off and filed something and fixed it up. So it worked. Well, that kind of encouraged me. Now, from that time, I always would, you know, fix people's radios, and I got a kind of lesson in succession of difficulty. The first one was a loose thing that the man helped me with. The next problem was it didn't work at all somewhere. The radio, but it was easy. If it doesn't work at all, it isn't plugged in right. It was just a the plug, okay? But as it went along, it got more and more complicated. I got more and more elaborate. I had bought myself a meters in New York and resistors and stuff and made a, a voltmeter had different scales on it out of one. You, you made your own voltmeter. I understood. I had the volt meter. Yeah. But I converted to a voltmeter by getting the appropriate resistances, which I calculated in terms of lengths of very fine copper wire. It wasn't very accurate, but it was good enough to tell whether things were in the right ballpark and different connections in those sets. You see, I played with radios. I bought them in rummage sale. I used to take them apart and fix them up and make them go. I used to listen to them. not short wave, but long wave, but you can get long distance at night. Yeah, right. And battery sets and everything. I had all this crap. I played a lot with it. What kind of sets? Batteries. Big oh, batteries. Yeah, yeah. Storage mm -hmm. batteries. Mm -hmm. I had a lab. I had a lab. Wow. Batteries and I had these sets. And then I, you know, in fact, before I fixed radios, I had this set. It started with the crystal sets, and then I went on and bought two things with batteries. And I, once I got Texas, that was tremendously exciting. I mean, I, you you get so you can go very far. And then I got this thing so I could hear a station in Schenectady. I was down in New York, but I could hear a station in Schenectady, WGN. And they had a program, and the Eno Crime Club was the name of the program. Eno Effervescent Salts. I had these stories all the time. It was a succession, some detective, going through a succession. Yeah, serial. Yeah, it was a serial. I discovered that I could hear this thing on WGN the hour before it was broadcast in New York. So I discovered what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I called all those kids and listened to it every day. It was the thing. Because I lived in a house with two cousins, of course, four of us in the house. And then the neighbors would come. And all the guys are sitting around and listening to the email kind of And I said, you know, we haven't heard from so-and-so in a long time. I, said, I bet you he comes now, because that will save the situation. Two seconds later, book, book, he comes. You know? <laughs> well, they got all excited about this, and I predicted a couple of other things. Then they realized that there must be something in it. I must know somehow. So they, I owned up to what it was. But upstairs, I had this thing. And so you know what the result was. They couldn't wait, naturally, for the regular hour. Because it was already, they all had to sit upstairs with this little creaky radio listening an hour ahead to the, you know, trying to open it in my room all the time because of that. For weeks we yeah, did that. That's, that's like the election. Yeah, I, yeah. I try to wait until the next morning to yeah. find out what happened when yeah. the returns are complete. Right. But I fi still idea. find myself trying to hear it a few hours earlier. Well, uh, I then, we lived in a big house. It was a house that was left by my grandfather to his children. And they didn't have much money with the house they had. So we owned this house and we lived in it. And it was a very large, wooden, beautiful wood house. They like pretty good. And I would run wires outside all around the house and had plugs on all the rooms that I could plug in and listen to my radios upstairs. I had them all connected. And then I discovered something. One day I had a loudspeaker uh, not the speaker, but the part of it without the big horn on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some earphones. Presumably, I was connecting the speaker with all the earphones to some plug downstairs. But I had a three-way plug, you know, I mean, an ordinary plug that has more than one thing connected. And I had the speaker in it, and I had the earphones in it, and I had the earphones on. 
So that speaker is connected to the earphone. And I'm just playing around, and I put my finger in the speaker, and I hear it in the earphone. And I scratch the speaker, I hear it in the earphone. So I discovered, if you jiggle in a magnet, you generate a voltage which you can hear. So I realized that the speaker could act like a microphone, and it didn't even need any batteries. And so I went to the school and I gave a demonstration of the telephone. I made a telephone from outside the door to inside. We were talking about Alexander Graham Bell. And I didn't know it, but I think that's the telephone he originally used. But I tried to say that wasn't. That was a different one. But I didn't know. But I think it's the right one. Yeah, that was what he originally used. But the present telephone was a carbon resistance variation at that time. Mm -hmm. I knew that it was not the way the regular telephone worked, but it was very interesting. But then I had a microphone, you see. So then I used to do broadcasting from upstairs, downstairs, and from downstairs, upstairs, using the amplifiers of my rummage sale radios, you see. And one time, my little sister, who's nine years younger than I was, so she must have been about two or three, or something like that, was downstairs. And my cousin, who's three years younger, Francis, who lives in Washington, and I sat her down. There was at that time a guy called Uncle Don on the radio that she liked to listen to. And he was, you know, this is your Uncle Don. He'd sing little songs, good children, and this and that. And so we said, that there's a special program she should listen to. So we ran upstairs and we start the broadcast. This is Uncle Don. This is a, we have Noah, a very nice little girl that lives at such and such a time. And she's got a birthday coming, not today, but such and such. You know, and she's a cute girl, this, that, this, that. And then we made a song, then we made music, and stuff like that, went through the whole deal. And then we come downstairs, you know, how was it? You know, we thought we'd fool her. She's only two or three, she says to me, it was good, but why did you make the music with your mouth? <laughs> anyway, I got into the repair business from those beginnings, and I went into fixing radio. And I got a kind of series of lessons of ever-increasing difficulty. You're lucky to have the... Yeah, course. well, ultimately, I got some job, like to convert a DC set to an AC set, which I failed to succeed in. It was very hard to keep the hump from going through the system, and I didn't build it quite right. It was not bad, but it wasn't very good. It turned out it was too much hump. I didn't realize. I shouldn't have bitten that off. That was too tough. Mm -hmm. But I did a lot of other things. The reason people hired me is the depression. They didn't have any money to fix their radios. And they'd hear about this kid who would do it less. So I'd climb out roofs to fix antennas and all kinds of stuff. Hmm. But I remember one repair job that was really, I felt wonderful about this. I got this through, I was also working at the time for a printer. And the man who knew the printer knew I was trying to get jobs fixing radios, and he was trying to help me. So he got this guy. He told this fellow that there's this boy that fixes radios. The guy comes around. He's obviously poor. Hasn't got any money because his car is a complete wreck. And we go in his car to his house, which is in some cheap car. No money. So on the way, he says to me, I said, what's the trouble? He says, the trouble is that when I turn it on, it makes this noise. And after a while, the noise stops. And then everything's all right, but I don't like the noise at the beginning. I think to myself, if he hasn't got any money, he'd think he could, you know, what the hell, a little noise for a while. So I went to the thing, and I turned it on. Little noise! My God! No wonder the poor guy couldn't even stand it. The thing began to roar and wobble, go, wobble, 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 wobble. <laughs> noise! Tremendous amount of noise, and then it quieted down. And went. Completely, or it just... quieted down somewhat. and played correctly. The noise disappeared. Oh. And when he first saw me, he says, hey, you know anything about radios? And he, all the time he's on the way, he says, well, how do you know about radios? You're just a little boy. You know, he's putting me down the whole way, you see. And I'm thinking, so what the hell's the matter with it? It makes a little noise. But I got there, I found out it made my mind. Then I start to think, how could that happen? I start walking back and forth thinking. Yeah. And then I realized that way it could happen is that the tubes are heating up in the wrong order. That is, the amplifier is all hot, the tubes are ready to go, and there's nothing feeding in, or there's some back circuit feeding in, or something wrong from the beginning part, the RF part. And therefore, it's making a lot of noise, picking up something. And then when the RF circuits finally go and adjust the grid voltages and so on, everything's all right. So therefore, all I have to do is make the tubes heat up in a different order. Now, in those days, they made many sets where they used the same tube numbers in different places, you see. Now it's all different, but they were like, what the hell was it? 212. 212. It would be all along. So I walked back and forth. He says, so what are you doing? I said, I'm thinking. <laughs> you know, this guy was really a bother. He says, we come in and fix the radio. You just walk back and forth. I said, I'm thinking. Then I thought this out. 
And then I said, oh, I take the tubes and I reverse the order completely in the set so that the ones that are heating up first will be the ones that were, you know, something. I took all the tubes out and he placed them in the opposite order. I stepped to the front, I turned the thing on, it's as quiet as a lamb, it, it, it waits until it heats up, you know, it took time. Then it would play perfectly and there was no noise. The guy was, you know, when a person is negative to you and you do something like that, then the other way, 100%. You know, the kind of the cop that said, he got me other jobs, he kept telling everybody what a tremendous genius I was. I fix radios by thinking. <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea of thinking to fix a radio, I never thought that was possible. <laughs> you know, the little boy stops and thinks and figures out how to do it. <laughs> wow. So that's what it was a big success. That was a big success. Wow. I mostly succeeded in everything except that one AC to DC transformation, which was a That's failure. good. I shouldn't have tried that. That was too hard. Nobody can do that. Mm. But with the it was terribly difficult. Because like everything was battery sets. There were a lot of battery sets in those days. And there were AC lines, and, and people were beginning to get AC sets. They had special radio tubes, and they had to be specially balanced so that the AC didn't work its way through the amplifier. So I thought, well, I figure it out, you know, and I tried to do it using the old tubes for DC sets, and trying to balance the filaments with a central transformer. It didn't work. Too much noise came through, but I couldn't get it to zero. But otherwise, everything was. But going through, through a radio everything. circuit gave you a good chance to exercise logic and. Oh yeah. Well, those days the radio circuits were much easier to do something, but everything was out. I mean, you, you take this part the set. Every set was entirely different from every other set. So. It was a big problem to find the right screws, but when you got it, everything could be taken apart. And then you could look at everything. You could see which is a resistor, there's a condenser, there's a this, there's a that. And they were labeled and they were, the wax had been dripping on the condenser, it was too hot. You could tell that the condenser was burned out. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Or there was a charcoal on one of the resistors. Or if not, you'd test it with these little things to see what the resistance or whether the voltage was coming through. The sets were simple, the circuits were not complicated. The voltage on the grids was always about one and a half or two volts. The voltages on the plates were a couple of hundred or a hundred or two hundred DC. Mm -hmm. And they, it was relatively easy for a guy to understand the circuit. Mm -hmm. They weren't very complicated. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't hard for me to really do it by understanding what was going on inside and noticing that something wasn't working right and finding it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it took me quite a while. I remember one particular one where I took three or four hours to find a resistor, which was not apparent, but it was out. It was, uh, that particular time happened to be a friend of my mother's. I had time. You see. There was nobody on my back saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Instead, they were saying, would you like a little uh, milk or something, cake? Yeah. You know, Take a break now. Yeah, but I did it. I finally did it because I have a 